All right, so chapter 43 is about the immune system. Pathogens, bacteria, viruses, fungi, um, agents that can cause disease um, affect all sorts of animals, not just humans. Um, the immune system is able to recognize the majority of these foreign bodies and provide um, immune cells to help protect us. All animals um, are born with innate immunity um, that would be, um, it's present before you're exposed to anything, it's affected from your birth, um, those are external barriers. There's also some cellular and chemical defenses inside of animal bodies that are able to help um, provide that Im innate immunity. And then vertebrates um, have adaptive or what we call acquired immunity, um, which we obtain when we are exposed to agents um, like bacteria or viruses or microbes. So the innate immunity is nonspecific. It's across the board. It applies to everything. Well, adaptive immunity is like a puzzle piece. Only certain immune cells are going to recognize certain pathogens or react to certain pathogens. So this is just kind of um, comparing the two. Again, innate is looking at generic. Adaptive is looking at specific. You've got examples there of barrier defenses with innate immunity, your skin, your mucous membrane, secretions, um, internal defenses are certain cells and proteins, and then just the inflammatory response that will take place. The adaptive immunity, again, only applies to vertebrates. Um, it's a little bit slower, but it is uh, more specific. There's a humoral response, and then there's a cell-mediated response. The humoral response is looking at what's in your interstitial fluid, in your blood, um, the lymph, things like that, while the cell-mediated is um, looking at cells that have been infected. So we're going to talk about innate immunity first. Um, being able to recognize it is going to be looking at some traits that are kind of common to different path um, pathogens. Um, again, it's not just found in animals. It's also found in plants. Um, and this is basically your first line of defense um, and leads the way for adaptive immunity. So in vertebrates, this is all they have. Um, so with insects, they have an exoskeleton, which is able to serve as a barrier. Um, their digestive system is protected by um, a chitin-based barrier and has lysozyme, which helps to break down bacterial cell walls. And remember that because their blood is not separate from their lymph, um, they have hemocytes that circulate throughout that hemolymph, and they carry out phagocytosis where they can chew things up. Um, they also are able to secrete proteins that have antimicrobial properties, which help to break down plasma membranes that aren't of those invertebrates, of fungi and bacteria. Um, and they can recognize bacteria and fungi by different structures that are found only on their cell walls. And depending on what type of pathogen they're encountering, you're going to have a, diff a slightly different immune response if they are within that body. Okay, so there are some examples of pathogens. You've got your phagocytic cell. They've been endocytosed into a vacuole. Lysosome is fusing with that vacuole and destroying that pathogen. So vertebrates is the one that we know the most about. Um, if we talked about the barrier defenses. We talked about phagocytosis, and we talked about the peptides. Um, and then we have a couple, well, well, one type of cell, the natural killer cells. We have our inflammatory response and we have interferons, which also can play a role with our innate immunity. So barrier defenses, um, again, your skin is um, one of the best protections you have with your body um, or with any particular animal. Mucous membranes also play a role because the mucus is able to help to trap and remove those microbes. Um, a lot of our body fluids are not ones that are inhabitable for microbes. And then the pH of our skin, and remember we talked a lot about the digestive system, how low it is, um, that also helps to prevent bacterial growth. Um, when they enter the mammalian body, um, they get recognized um, by TLRs, toll-like receptors. And there are different types of toll-like receptors. They can be on your membrane or they can actually be within the cell. Um, 
if, for example, a white blood cell is going to take in a microbe, it might be able to use a lysosome to help get rid of it. Um, there are lots of different phagocytic cells. We have neutrophils, macrophages, dendritic cells, and eosinophils. We're going to spend a lot more time talking about dendritic cells when we get to adaptive immunity. Um, the neutrophils are able to break up pathogens. Um, macrophages kind of just move throughout the body, and they're able to absorb um, pathogens. And the eosinophils help to break things apart. So these are the TLRs I was talking about. They represent or recognize markers of foreign um, substances, um, bacteria, viruses, fungi, et cetera, that are not found in animal bodies. Um, so you notice that some are on the membrane and then you have the CPG DNA and the DSRNA that are in that vesicle. And you've got the two toll receptors there, the TLR9, the TLR3. Um, you, the CPG is uh, got some unmethylated um, cytosine, guanosine um, DNA bases, and then double strand RNA is kind of unique to viruses. So, if something is able to, like a virus, is able to move its genome into a cell, those receptors might help to recognize it and destroy it before it's able to replicate itself. Um, other innate defenses we have are natural killer cells. Those are um, one type of lymphocyte we're going to talk about in this chapter. Um, they move throughout the body, and when they recognize that there are cells that are abnormal, um, they can cause apoptosis to take place, release chemicals causing cell death. Um, this could result in cells that have been infected by viruses dying off or cancerous cells dying off. Um, and we'll spend a lot more time talking about the um, how cells are able to defend um, with the lymphatic system when we get into adaptive immunity. But obviously, they play a role with innate as well. So we have lymph nodes throughout our body. Um, these lymph nodes um, are have capillaries galore along with interstitial fluid, and they have lots of defensive cells that are stored in them. So that if there is something that a pathogen that your body needs to fight, um, swollen lymph nodes are often a good indicator that there's an issue. Notice there's a lot around your head. You also have some up near your shoulders, um, in your digestive region. Um, they're throughout your body. Um, and you also have organs that are just a part of your immune system. We'll spend a lot of time talking about your thymus. Um, you've got your spleen, you see the adenoid and tonsils up the top, your appendix we talked about has um, some um, immune, um, immunological benefits, and this is not on there, but you also have your bone marrow, which is able to produce um, quite a lot of B cells. So antimicrobial peptides and proteins, um, these attack pathogens or prevent them from being able to reproduce themselves. Um, a big example of those would be your interferon proteins. Um, they are released um, by cells that have been infected by viruses as kind of a warning signal to let them know that there's a, a pathogen nearby that they need to prepare for. Um, and then there are proteins that make up what's called the complement system, which will help to um, lyse invading cells, and that can cause inflammation to take place. So the inflammatory response was another one we talked about with your innate immunity. Um, so pain and swelling um, that comes about as a result of some sort of injury or potential infection. Um, how that's able to take place. Mast cells are a type of connective tissue um, that are kind of dispersed throughout the body, and they are able to release histamine when they are signaled to do so. When they release that histamine, it can cause your blood vessels to dilate, um, makes them more permeable, allows things to move to the site of injury or infection um, so that it can be attacked. Um, they, um, macrophages and neutrophils will also release what are called cytokines that can um, help to kind of make that immune response even more pronounced. 
Um, and then if you have pus, you have, um, that's kind of a good indication that you do have some sort of infection um, because that has a combination of white blood cells and then the pathogens that have been killed off along with um, any cell debris from cells that were not able to survive that particular um, pathogen. So in this case, a splinter has entered in um, the epidermis. Um, as it's moved in, there's a pathogen that's surrounding that splinter. So the mast cells are going to send off signaling molecules along with the macrophages. Um, and that's going to cause the capillary there to dilate, allow some of those neutrophils, we talked about those, come out and start to um, break down that pathogen. Um, and then as it is, um, the pathogen is destroyed, we see that the swelling um, has definitely diminished. Fluid is no longer uh, moving out of the capillary. The capillary has narrowed again and that things are starting to return back to normal. You can have inflammatory responses that are at a specific location or you can have them be systemic throughout the whole body. Um, fever would be one of those examples. Fever is triggered um, by pyrogens that are released by um, some of those immune um, the cells that are attacking macrophages, as well as toxins that are released from the pathogens. When you go into what's called septic shock, um, your immune system has gone haywire. Um, you are having an overwhelming response to whatever is taking place and your body is at a point where it just doesn't recognize um, what it is trying to attack. Um, sometimes, um, whether you're a doctor or a veterinarian, they're able to get that under control, um, but uh, other times they are not able to. Um, so innate immunity, we said, was the first line of defense. Um, pathogens, however, have, um, again, survive or um, they, they want to survive as much as they possibly can. So they have come up with ways to help to avoid being recognized. Um, they've changed their surface. Um, and, or sometimes they just aren't able to be destroyed by phagocytosis. Um, tuberculosis is one such pathogen or is one such disease caused by a pathogen that's able to avoid destruction. So adaptive immunity is when we are able not just to focus on generally, it doesn't really matter what the pathogen is. Adaptive immunity is focused on specific pathogens. Um, and it is based primarily on your lymphocytes. Um, your lymphocytes make up anywhere from a quarter to almost half of your white blood cells and pretty much all of your lymph cells. Um, there are two major lymphocytes that are going to play a role. We talked about the natural helper cells before, um, T cells and B cells. And I'm not sure if they're named for where they are generated, but sure as that would make sense to me. Um, T cells are matured in the thymus above the heart and B cells are matured in your bone marrow. They each have receptor proteins that can bind to those foreign molecules. And once they have bound, they, um, their receptor proteins are unique. And we'll talk about how those work out um, so that they only are going to recognize certain foreign molecules, which is how we're able to make it more specific for that particular pathogen. Um, so when I was doing this, I wanted to try to give you something to compare and contrast the two. Like, why do we have to have two different types of lymphocytes um, playing a role in this? Um, the T cells make up the vast majority of your composition of your lymphocytes that are running around. Um, the B cells are a smaller portion, but they are pretty important. They are involved with the humoral immune response, so they are affecting what's found in your blood, what's found in your lymph, what's found in the interstitial fluid. While the T cells help with that humoral response, but they are primarily responsible for the cell mediated. Um, they help to identify cells that have been infected. Both of them are going to have memory cells and effector cells, and they're going to have that for um, the memory cells are what they are for B cells. The plasma cells are the effector. They're the ones that are actually going to do the work, at least initially. Um, both cytotoxic and helper are going to have memory and effector forms. Um, the B cells are the ones that are able to make your antibodies. Um, the T cells do not. 
they make leukokine signals that help to recognize what's going on. B cells are pretty stationary. Um, they don't have to be in the specific area of that pathogen. Well, the T cells will move towards it. Um, we'll talk about why the B cells don't have to move because they just release the antibodies and the antibodies go to work. Um, the B cells are able to bind to the antigen directly that they are trying to recognize while the T cells can't bind to it directly, whether it's a cytotoxic or a helper T cell, they have to have it presented to them um, by being attached to a protein. Um, and we'll talk about it. it's called an MHC. Um, B cells do not live for an extended period of time. while T cells do. Um, in terms of if you have had um, any sort of skin graft or if, there are cancerous cells. Um, B cells don't have any issue with either of those, but T cells do. Um, I said before, B cells are able to recognize those antigens directly, um, while T cells um, are not able to recognize them directly. They have to be found on the outside of a cell that has already been infected with a bacterial or a viral, a bacteria or a virus or even a fungus. So antigens play a role with both B cells and T cells. Um, they um, are able to do that by activating um, those cells with the receptors that recognize the specific parts of that pathogen. And the part that actually binds to the receptor on the B cells and T cells when it's presented to it is the epitope. Okay, so you can kind of see that there in that picture. Um, we're going to talk about the structure of B cells, and then we'll talk about the structure of T cells. You'll notice that B cells um, have Y-shaped antigen receptors. Um, the heavy chain is the one that's attached to the cell itself. The light chains are the ones that are making up the um, vertical, sorry, um, the, well, I guess it's diagonal, lines of the Y. The there are variable regions and constant regions to um, the, the Y portion of that antigen receptor. Um, the constant regions don't change a whole lot, but the variable regions are what allow them to each recognize different pathogens um, or, or different antigens which are coming from those pathogens. Okay, so um, again, you've got this breaking down. Your heavy chains are actually connected to um, the B cell through the cell membrane. Um, the antigen bonding side is in that variable region. And again, those are gonna vary to recognize different antigens that are coming from your pathogens. How they're able to recognize it. Um, so when there's binding to an antigen that's present in either the blood or the lymph, um, it will help to secrete, it will help to make copies of that B cell that will, or, or copies of other cell, of similar cells will be formed that will generate um, proteins known as antibodies um, or immunoglobulins. And these antibodies are going to look a lot like the B cell receptors, but they are not physically connected to these cells. And so they can go out and attack the pathogens directly. So on the left, we have our B cell. We've got our antigen receptors. We see where the B cell has been attached to the epitope part of the pathogen. So that will help to activate the B cell. We'll come back to that a little bit later once we talk about T cells. And once we have activated our B cell, it's able to go through proliferation, make oodles of copies of itself. And those copies generate a protein that looks a heck of a lot like that antigen receptor, but is no longer attached. Those antigen receptors then can go out and identify the epitopes that are out there that they match up with and tag them. When it comes to T cells, the um, we talked about how with the, the B cells, you had the chains that were identical. Um, you don't have identical chains that are connected through the cell membrane. You have two different polypeptide chains, the alpha and the beta ones. And then they still do have the variable in the constant region. And 
in order for them to bind to antigen fragments, they have to be bonded to, or the antigen fragments have to be presented to the T cells, um, either from a macrophage or a dendritic cell. Um, and they're bonded to cell surface proteins, the MHC, the world uh, molecules. And if they aren't being presented, the T cells can't do anything about them. MHC is called major histocompatibility complex. Um, these host proteins basically put these antigen fragments out for display. And once they are out there and the right T cell finds that particular antigen, it can bind to it. When it binds to that particular antigen fragment, it's going to help to activate that T cell. And then we're going to see what it's able to do with the adaptive immune response. So just like I showed you with the B cell, the T cell is not going to be more of a Y shape. It's just more of two horizontal, um, or sorry, two vertical um, polypeptides. Um, you have the part that's connected to the cell membrane, and then you have your variable in your constant regions. That part's still the same. But in order for the T cell to be able to pick up that antigen, Whatever has been invaded by the pathogen or has taken up the particular pathogen has to bring some sort of fragment of that pathogen to the surface so the T cell can attach to it. So before we get into a little bit more about what's going to happen next, characteristics both the B cells and T cells um, have in common when it comes to the adaptive immune system. Um, we've got a lot of different lymphocytes taking place. We've got a lot of different receptors. They are not likely to attack their own molecules unless there's some sort of problem. They are able to make lots of copies once they have been activated. They're able to proliferate. And we talked about how they're able to act immediately. And then they're able to act in the long term because we keep um, an immunological memory. We keep we recognize them again in the future. So B cells and T cells, um, we talked about these variable elements, that so they're able to recognize a lot of different antigen receptors. The IgG gene is going to take care of one of the chains of your B cell receptor, but you can make lots of different forms of it by physically rearranging your DNA. And then when it goes to transcription translation, we have different antigen receptors form. So if your B cell has yet to become differentiated, it has all the different possibilities that it could have to recognize the variable and constant regions for its particular type of cell it will randomly delete sections between the variable and the J segment, um, which will be used to help determine what is going to be its variable region and what is going to be its particular, the, well, sorry, the constant region stays put. The variable region is made up of that B and the J. So B cells and T cells, we've talked a lot about how all your cells have a copy of all the DNA in your body. Your B cells and your T cells will not have that. They do if they're undifferentiated, but once they have been differentiated and so that they will produce specific um, antigen receptors, they no longer have all of the DNA um, that would be found in pretty much any other undifferentiated cell in your body. Okay. Or eat like sorry, not just undifferentiated cells, your cardiac cells, your nerve cells, everything else still has a copy of all the DNA, even though it has already been determined, the B cells and T cells no longer do. Um, so the antigen receptors are generated by those random DNA rearrangements. Um, again, they are produced in your bone marrow and they're produced in your thymus. We want to make sure that we don't let out potential B cells or T cells that would be recognized um, that would recognize our body as foreign. Um, and so if for some reason they do show some sort of self-reactivity, um, they get destroyed or they get rendered non-functional. So there are antigen receptors. So this is like the lock and key. There are antigen receptors that will recognize a variety of epitopes. And there are ones that... 
um, for the, and there's only a few of those out there. The vast majority aren't going to only going to recognize certain keys, certain antigens. So when an antigen has been um, identified and brought to the lymph nodes, lymphocytes get um, exposed to it until we find a match, until we find one that fits together. And once that mature lymphocyte um, is bonded to the antigen, then it causes that lymphocyte to be activated. Again, the B cell and T cell will go through proliferation. They'll make lots of copies of themselves. We call that clonal selection. And we talked about how two types of cells get made. The short-lived effector cells that go and attack the antigen directly, and then the ones that actually stay intact, the memory cells, which could create those effector cells again um, if that antigen shows up. So you've got your B cells that are going to have different variation on your antigens being able to, um, to bind to them. Once you have found ones that are able to bind to that particular antigen, lots and lots of copies get made. And then we have ones that stay together and ones that secrete um, the antibody protein, the plasma cells that can then go and attack that antigen. Immunological memory will help to protect us against diseases. Um, so when I was younger, we did not have a, a vaccination for chickenpox. Um, we were exposed to chickenpox because that was our way of building up our immunological memory for it. Um, I would imagine you all had your vaccinations. The first exposure you get to it, whether it be through a vaccination or infection, is going to be your primary immune response. Um, when that takes place, the B cells and T cells that match up with that antigen are going to form their effector forms and they're going to have your memory forms. And then in the secondary immune response, if you got exposed to it a second time, the memory cells would hopefully help to give you a more efficient, um, faster response. That's the whole idea behind vaccinations. That's why um, it's recommended we do the flu shots so that if you are exposed to um, the, if the flu that they have, they predict is the one that's going to be coming out and is used to make that vaccination is the one that actually is out. If you have had some exposure to it previously, that's going to help your immune system be able to attack it more quickly. So primary immune response to antigen A produces antibodies to A. And then if you give it a little more time and you get exposed to A again, as well as B, you're still going to have the same amount. Uh, well, sorry, you're going to have a much larger percentage of concentration of antibodies to A because you've already been exposed to it. Well, antibody B has got to go to work to get developed. Adaptive immunity doesn't just um, defend against your body fluids. It also defends against your body cells. Um, we talked about a little bit earlier about the humoral and the cell-mediated response. And the humoral immune response, your antibodies, which are coming from your B cells, are going to help to identify those toxins and pathogens and destroy them, or sorry, not destroy them themselves, are going to help to neutralize and make them, make your other immune cells recognize the phagocytic cells to help destroy them in the blood or the lymph. While in your cell-mediated immune response, the T cells actually go and destroy those host cells or make them recognizable so that they can go through phagocytosis. Helper T cells are the ones that cause T cells to have a role both in the humoral and the cell-mediated immune responses. Um, if you're going to activate a helper T cell, um, you have to have something, uh, another cell type. It could be a dendritic cell. It could be a macrophage that has that MHC complex. Um, and then the antigen attached to it or fragment of the antigen attached, attached to it so that the helper T cell can bind to it. And when that happens, signals will be given off that will help to generate antibodies from your B cells and it will help to activate your cytotoxic T cells um, so that you can go to town on this particular pathogen. Um, there are two types of antigen presenting cells. Um, there are, oh, I'm gonna, I knew I was gonna forget the name of this. 
They're professional and non-professional. Um, the professional are the ones that we've been dealing with the most. They're the ones that are found with your, are, are going to be recognized by your helper T cells. They have the class two MHC molecules on them and they have an accessory protein, specific one CD4, which actually allows the helper T cells to bind to that antigen that's been presented on the cell surface with that class two MHC molecule. When that binding takes place, um, signals are given off and it activates that helper T cell so that it'll make multiple copies of itself. Um, and then once it's made those clones and has lots of helper T cells, they're going to release some other protein cytokines, which will in turn help to activate your B cells and activate your cytotoxic T cells. Okay, so examples of these types of antigen presenting cells are your macrophages and your dendritic cells. Um, and again, you could have it be a B cell as well. So you've got this fragment that's um, been taken in by the pathogen or by the antigen presenting cell as it started to try to, um, as it's being attacked by this pathogen that gets sent to the cell membrane where it is attached to it and presented to that helper T cell. Um, the signals cause um, the T cell to be activated to make lots of copies of itself and then cytokines get released to help to get the B cells going and the cytotoxic T cells so that we have both types of immunity taking place, both the humoral so that we can take care of any pathogens that are like this in our blood um, or in our lymph, or and then we can take care of the cells that have already been invaded with the cell-mediated immunity through the cytotoxic T cells. So the cytotoxic T cells are the effector form of your cell-mediated response. You, um, they will recognize fragments on the cells um, that have been infected. Um, and they'll have an MHC complex as well that has a frag that, that antigen fragment attached to them. But they're going to be attached to the class one forms, the non-professional ones. And they have a different type of accessory protein, CD8. When these cytotoxic T cells are activated, they're going to produce proteins that will help to break down the target cells, perforins, and cause apoptosis to occur through another type of protein, granzymes. Once it has um, started to destroy that cell, it then can be released and go off and attack other cells that have been infected. So there you're seeing that process take place. We talked about earlier how B cells are able to work on your humoral response, but to be activated, to get them going, um, we need those helper T cells to play a role. So the helper T cells that have been activated will recognize the B cells that have that particular um, antigen already bonded to their receptor. So when the two of them connect together, that will work to activate the B cells and cause them to form both the memory and the effector cells that secrete the antibodies in the form of plasma cells. So again, you already got your helper T cell good to go. Your B cell already has specifically identified that same pathogen, has those antigens for that pathogen attached to its antigen receptors. When the activated T helper cell binds to the B cell, it will cause it to be activated and to proliferate through the cytokines that are being released to signal and you'll produce those memory B cells and your plasma cells that will secrete the antibodies, which then can go and recognize more copies of that pathogen. You've noticed that I haven't said that antibodies can kill off these pathogens. The cytotoxic T cells will destroy the cells that have been invaded by the pathogen, but the antibodies don't kill the pathogen directly. They just market so that other cells can come in and do their job. With neutralization, when the antibodies bind to the viral surface proteins um, or to toxins in the body fluid, they keep them from entering 
um, either the host cell or the body cell. While opsonization is focused on bacterial antigens, and that makes it possible for macrophages or neutrophils to um, phagocytose those particular um, bacterial cells. Um, you can also have what's called an antigen antibody complex form that if it binds to one of those complement proteins can cause a whole group of them to come after it. Basically, you have a big attack take place, um, which will cause a pore to open up and allow water um, to flow in. And that will lyse the particular, the, um, the cell containing that pathogen. With your B cells, there's lots of variation in terms of the types of antibodies that, that can be generated, the immunoglobulins. There's five different general forms or classes um, that are going to have different heavy chains, the ones that are connected to the cell membrane. Um, we have IgD, IgM, IgG, IgE, and IgA. IgD is the one that is going to um, serve for your B cells, the antigen receptors. So that one's membrane bound. That one's not going to go anywhere too much. Um, the IgM is the one that is going to be released during an initial exposure. Um, the IgG is the one that plays the biggest role. Um, it's the one that protects us against bacterial and viruses. Um, IgE is the one that gives you histamines if you have allergic reactions. And IgA is going to prevent bacteria from attaching to epithelial tissue. And we'll see why that's important very shortly. So the humoral and cell mediated will both have primary and secondary immune responses. It's the memory cells that make that secondary response possible. Uh, sorry. So active and passive immunization, active and passive immunity. Active immunity is what's going to form when your memory cells make those clones, either as a result of responding to an infection or having a vaccination take place. Um, when you have a vaccination, you are being exposed to a form that is not harmful. Um, that's supposed to help to kind of get your immune system to recognize it for future possibilities. Passive immunity is going to be present immediately, but it does not last um, for an extended period of time. Uh, you will see here that this is when a mom is um, carrying a fetus, IgG, the one that kind of helps to protect against bacteria and viruses will cross over the placenta to help to provide some immunity to the fetus. And then we talked about IgA a little bit earlier. Um, that is able to move from mother to infant through breast milk. So remember we talked about how that's supposed to kind of help with bacteria on epithelial tissue. That would be why. Um, you can also get artificial passive immunity by giving an individual um, antibodies that is not immune to that particular um, pathogen. So I talked about professional and non-professional APC cells, antigen presenting cells. Your antigen can be recognized by your B cell, but the B cell won't get activated until that T helper cell has been activated. Um, the antigen can be recognized by the T helper cell. And if that antigen is coming from either a virus infected cell or is a cancerous cell, those can be recognized directly by cytotoxic T cells. Regardless of which one, the helper T cells, again, are the ones that are going to work directly on the B cells and the cytotoxic T cells. The B cells are able to make the memory cells as well as the plasma cells, which then can send out those antibodies throughout the bloodstream and the lymph to take care of any extracellular pathogens. The T helper cells, again, they do not directly attack um, either cells that have been infected or the extracellular pathogens, but they are able to activate both the B cells and the cytotoxic T cells. They are able to make copies of themselves. So the effector cells for the helper T cells are the cytotoxic T cells. 
They're able to make memory cells to better prepare for a second exposure. We've got memory cells for B cells, memory help for T cells, and we have memory help cytotoxic T cells. So those can be generated as well from the cytotoxic T cells along with the ones that are active and go after the cells that have been invaded by pathogens um, or cancer, viruses, bacteria, fungi. So this whole idea of antibodies being so specific um, has been examined a lot in medical research. Um, we have polyclonal antibodies, um, which are clones of lots of different plasma cells. So they are able to recognize multiple epitopes. And then we have monoclonal so that if you just want to study one particular one or you happen to need a particular type of B cells, you can grow monoclonal antibodies as well. Okay. These antibodies and these antigen receptors um, are going to cause some difficulties if we have transplants, whether it be organs or tissues or even blood, um, because our immune system attacks, we, it's prepared to leave self cells alone, but it's not prepared to leave foreign cells alone. Our blood, we talked about this when we did genetics, about how you could determine blood types and, and things like that. Um, the blood types are determined by the antigens that are present on those blood cells, whether they have A antigens, B antigens, AB antigens, or they don't have antigens at all. They're considered to be O. Whatever blood type you are, you're going to have antibodies in your blood for the blood types that you aren't. So if you try to transfuse a person that has B blood with AB blood, they're not going to recognize that they're going to, it's going to look at it as a foreign entity because it's got A antibodies present. Um, so really have to be careful with how transfusions are done um, to make sure that the right combinations are, that what's being transfused will be accepted um, by the recipient. We also have this issue with tissues and organ transplants. Those MHC molecules that we said that are used to help recognize um, the different T cells are going to be unique um, unless you are genetically identical. Um, because they are unique, um, you that's one of the um, definitely one of the areas that they will look at with transplants to see how closely related you are. Because if your MHC molecules are too different, um, it's, even though it might be a great match, it's not going to work out because you're going to have rejection either of those tissue grafts or those organ transplants. There are medications you can take to kind of help with that transplantation process, um, but that would result obviously in lowering your immune system, making it a little more compromised. So you need to be careful with that. Um, and it's also why if you're having a bone marrow transplant, you basically have to get rid of all the lymphocytes that were present in the um, recipient's bone marrow because those are the B cells. And if you have those present, and they don't match up, then they're just going to be rejected. So if the immune system isn't working properly, it can lead to disease or it can cause a much larger reaction to disease. Pathogens want to live. They want to survive. So they have made changes to kind of help to um, make the host immune response not work as effectively. And depending on the, the how much of an issue they cause with that immune system, it can cause temporary problems and it can cause long-term or fatal problems. So allergies. Um, this is when your, um, your body's response to antigens has gone overboard. Um, these antigens are known as allergens, um, and so it causes Ig E antibodies um, after you've been exposed initially to that particular allergen, 
um, to bind to receptors on mast cells. And you may remember when we first talked about mast cells, those are the ones that release histamine. And so when you're exposed to that allergen for a second time, you get your body's going to be recognizing, um, or sorry, that allergen is going to get recognized by these Ig E mast cell combination molecules, which is going to cause more histamine to be released. And that's when you start to see some of your allergy systems. And depending on how intense that response is, it could lead to anaphylactic shock. Okay. So there you go. You can see your mast cells, the Iggy's bound to it, the allergen binds to both of them, and now lots of histamines getting released. When you have an autoimmune disease, such as lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, MS, your immune system is not recognizing yourself anymore and starts to try to attack molecules in your body. Um, ways you can help your immune system out, things that can hurt your immune system. Exercise is thought to improve your immune system's function, so is rest. Um, psychological stress, not so much, um, because psychological stress doesn't just affect your immune system, it also affects your hormones and your nervous system, and it can cause all sorts of things to go out of whack. Immunodeficiency defeats immunodeficiency diseases. Inborn immunodeficiency is because maybe you had some sort of defects that led to your innate or your humoral or your cell media defenses not working properly. Acquired immunodeficiency is typically due to exposure to chemical or biological agents later in life. Um, that could include pathogens. AIDS is caused by a virus. Um, and when you get it, uh, one of these acquired immunodeficiency issues, um, typically the pathogens have been able to come up with some way to avoid your typical immune response. One way they are able to do that is through antigenic variation, where they are able to make their epitope not be expressed the same way or change things that are on their cell surface, markers, things like that, to make it not as likely to be recognized. Um, they go through mutations, which is what the flu, vi um, flu does. And so that's why we have new flu vaccines. Um, that's what they're hoping with, what they're seeing with COVID-19 is that it is not mutating drastically. So that is why there is hope that a vaccination can be made for this or a vaccine. Um, human viruses occasionally exchange genes with the viruses of domesticated animals or sometimes we have undomesticated animals exchange genes, um, their viruses exchange genes with either other undomesticated animals or domesticated animals. Um, when the human viruses get involved with these viruses exchanging genes, whether they be domesticated or undomesticated, um, our systems don't necessarily recognize them. And that's where we have a Problem. And that's what they're seeing in a small portion of the COVID-19 cases um, is that immune systems are aggressively overreacting because they don't know what to do with the COVID-19 virus. And so that's kind of showing what's going to happen with the antigenic variation and how you're going to develop antibodies for the different forms, um, but you have to do it each time. You don't have what we saw with the antibodies for A and B when it's the one that you've seen previously. So HIV, um, we talked about lysogenic and lytic viruses earlier on this year. Um, when you are lysogenic, the virus is able to stay in that host in, in an active form. It's called latency. Um, herpes simplex will do that. You don't have any symptoms unless every now and then you have a cold sore breakout. HIV, why it is such a big problem is that it goes after your helper T cells. And remember we talked about how that affects your immune responses for your cells, the cell mediated response, as well as that for what is in your blood um, or your lymph, the humoral response. Um, and if it is allowed um, to replicate itself without... Um, without any sort of medications, it can lead to AIDS. It can continue to break down those T cells. Um, so it's able to evade your immune system because of the latency issue as well as the antigenic variation. 
And if you do end up with AIDS, um, because your T cells have dropped so much, um, T cell cancer drops so much, um, it can lead to obviously infections that your body can no longer fight off or cancers. And um, if educating people about things to do so they can prevent HIV spread is probably the best way we can help to reduce HIV throughout the world. And so there's your latency period. Um, so again, they, the helper T cells are what they measure to determine whether you are, you just have HIV or whether you have full blown AIDS. Um, when you have issues with your adaptive immunity, um, we tend to see cancer frequency increase. Um, it says there, um, two out of every 10 human cancers are going to involve viruses. Um, immune system kind of helps to protect against those viruses um, that can cause cancer and can also attack the cancer cells that have viruses. And that's why um, they were able to come up with a vaccine. And I know that there's some debate about this with HPV, um, the virus that's associated with cervical cancer.